every evening we will present a nightly news special. For some time, we have felt that the range of our reporting on this program should be wider, that there are trends and events which require special treatment. So we've set up a staff to produce nightly news special reports on, well, everything under the sun. This week, the nightly news special consists of a five-part report on the Teamsters Union. When you think of Teamsters, you are likely to think of James Hoffa, but Hoffa's disappearance is only the latest episode in the battle to control the Teamsters. At stake is the enormous power of the Teamsters, the country's largest and toughest labor union. This series of special investigative reports will focus on that power and on its potential for corruption. Our report is NBC News correspondent Brian Ross. The country's largest union was built around the men who drove teams of horses. Teamsters, they were called. The year was 1899. As the country grew, so did the Teamsters Union. In the late 30s, the Teamsters began to organize the long-haul truck drivers whose labor was becoming an increasingly important part of the economy. There was violence. Troops were called in to help companies which resisted the union movement. Employers hired hoodlums and goons to break up Teamster strikes. The Teamsters got their own hoodlums and goons, and that was the beginning of a close working relationship between mobsters and the union. Let me see a copy of the subpoena, will you, Senator? Beg your pardon? 1957, the McClellan Senate Labor Rackets Committee found that among Teamster leaders were convicted murderers, extortionists, narcotics dealers, and a long list of other criminals. Determine about the subpoena, and then the chair will hear you. That same year, the AFL-CIO expelled the Teamsters for what it called corrupt influences in positions of leadership. The Teamsters went their own way and prospered. Now, the Teamsters Union is not only the biggest, but the fastest growing labor organization in the country. With more than two and a half million members, the union has a stranglehold on the nation's transportation system. Almost nothing moves without the Teamsters. The Teamsters are aggressive, sometimes ruthless organizers. And the union has expanded its power by organizing workers outside the transportation industries. The union's newest members, policemen. We're going to take that one over there. In Michigan, for example, there are now almost 3,000 police officers who are Teamsters. Ironically, police who belong to the Teamsters Union were among those who investigated the disappearance of James Hoffa. Some law enforcement authorities say police have no business joining the Teamsters because of the union's ties with organized crime. Sheriff John O'Brien says now that his deputies are Teamsters, he's worried that criminals will have access to his confidential files. And I cannot guarantee the confidentiality of uh, our investigative files, uh, nor can I uh, guarantee the secrecy of our targets of criminal investigation. There are those who say that with the allegations of wrongdoing and organized crime in the Teamsters Union, policemen have no business being in that union. Mm -hmm. That may be true uh, in terms of what they say. Uh, I don't know of any large organization that doesn't have its problems. Joseph Valenti says charges of mob connections will not stop the Teamsters from organizing police. Uh, wherever you can go, you want to go. Uh, that's my personal opinion. Why do the Teamsters want to represent policemen? Uh, we don't want to represent policemen per se. We want to represent the unorganized. We want to be able to take anybody that wants us. The Teamsters now represent police in Michigan, Minnesota, Virginia, Wisconsin, California, North Dakota, and Alaska. This worries law enforcement officials who say mob influence in the Teamsters is as strong as ever. There is no question that those persons uh, that are involved in the, the Teamsters Union at the management level have some very close ties and relationships with people in, who are identified as members of organized crime. Teamster President Frank Fitzsimmons denies there are organized crime ties with his union. Neither this union nor I am in the hands of organized crime. This union has nothing to hide on the general presidency of Frank Fitzsimmons. But law enforcement authorities say some of the men closest to Frank Fitzsimmons have clear ties with organized crime. William Presser, president of the Ohio Teamsters, an international union vice president. A business associate of Cleveland organized crime figures, Presser has been convicted of Taft-Hartley Act violations, antitrust law violations, obstruction of justice, 
and contempt of Congress. Joey Glimco, president of Chicago Teamsters Local 777. Glimco's police record dates back to 1923, with 38 arrests but only one conviction. Federal authorities say Glimco is closely associated with Chicago organized crime boss Tony Big Tuna Accardo. Anthony Provenzano, the dominant figure in New Jersey Teamsters, a close associate of Frank Fitzsimmons, and also, according to federal authorities, a close associate of major organized crime figures. Provenzano was sent to prison for extortion, was questioned last year in the disappearance of James Hoffa, and now is awaiting trial in a Teamster kickback conspiracy case. The Teamsters like to say the union is part of the American way of life, and most Teamsters are decent, hard-working men and women. But in the next four nights, we'll report on Teamsters who have criminal steel. Teamsters, including Union President Frank Fitzsimmons, who meet with organized crime figures. Teamsters who make questionable deals using union money. Teamsters who are the victims of their own union. And Teamsters who are trying to reform the union but making little progress. And we'll ask why. The government has done so little to investigate the abuses of Teamster power. Brian Ross, NBC News. And with that, we inaugurate a new feature on Nightly News, which will be on every evening, the Nightly News Special. These specials will deal with just about everything which needs special treatment, changes in lifestyle, politics, foreign affairs, consumer affairs, and hard investigative reporting. We'll have another investigative special on the Teamsters tomorrow night. Until then, good night for NBC News. This evening's Nightly News special is the second part of our investigative report on the Teamsters Union. Last night we showed how the Teamsters became the biggest and fastest growing union in the country. Tonight we deal with Teamster money with the millions of dollars in the union's pension fund for retired Teamsters. Take the union's central states pension fund. It has almost a billion and a half dollars in it. Our investigation found that the union officials who run the fund have been slow to pay out to retired union members, but quick to hand out millions in questionable business loans. Our reporter is Brian Ross. Paul Decker is 66 years old. He retired four years ago after working most of his life as a truck driver. Decker expected to live on a $350 a month Teamster pension, but the checks never came. The Teamsters Union told Decker he didn't qualify for a pension, but Decker knew he did. Decker took the Teamsters to court and proved his employer had made payments for him to the pension fund for the last 21 years. It took four years for Decker to win his case, and he had to spend $5,000 for lawyers. Decker stuck it out, but he says many other Teamsters don't fight the union and end up losing their pensions. But they just don't want to push it, and I told them, hell, you got a pension coming, all you got to do is go in the federal court. And I said, you get your pension. But they don't do it? No. And I'm 66 years old with a bad heart. What can they do to me? Did it concern you? Were you worried about your personal safety? Yeah, I used to check my car every morning before I went out. Why did you check your car? Looking for something. You think the Teamsters would do that to you? Sure. Damn right I do. The Teamster leaders who tried to deny Paul Decker his $350 a month pension have at the same time approved huge pension fund loans under very odd circumstances. This man is Alan Glick. He is 33 years old and in the real estate business. In less than a year and a half, Glick received an astounding $145 million in Teamster Pension Fund loans. A pension fund trustee, asked to explain why Glick got all that money, said it was because he's a nice kid. Glick's overnight financial empire is centered in Las Vegas, where, with Teamster money, he runs casinos and hotels. The Glick-Teamster relationship is now the subject of five separate federal and state investigations. This man is Mo Dalitz. Dalitz's relationship with the Teamster Pension Fund is also under close scrutiny. Dalitz was named in Keefe Offer Senate Crime Committee hearings in the 1950s as a major figure in organized crime in Ohio. 
This didn't stop the Teamsters Pension Fund from lending Daylitz more than $62 million to build the plush Rancho La Costa Resort in Southern California. Authorities say that Teamster loans often go to people with organized crime ties. The Teamsters would not answer our questions about the Central States Pension Fund. But NBC News has obtained a copy of a confidential audit of the fund listing 360 Teamster loans, totaling three quarters of a billion dollars. Investment analysts say the Teamsters seem to put an unusually high percentage of their money in high-risk businesses. Many of the people who get Teamster loans would have great difficulty getting money anyplace else. Millions of dollars in loans listed here have never been repaid. Investigators suspect that some Teamster loans set up businesses which serve as fronts to hide organized crime interests. This is Deming, New Mexico. The Teamsters lost $6 million here in loans to a company, now bankrupt, that made toy soldiers and plastic pails. Federal investigators trace the involvement of organized crime figures with the company. Federal prosecutors brought criminal charges against seven people, including three from the pension fund. The government charged the plastics company deal was a device to funnel money to organized crime and not intended to make money for the union pension fund. Two weeks before the trial, a key government witness was shot to death. The government dropped charges against one defendant. The six others were acquitted. Federal prosecutors say people are afraid to testify against the Teamsters. That's why it's very difficult to make cases in this area. Uh, you need an insider. You need someone to tell you about uh, where the shakedown or the illegal payments are coming from. And uh, these people feared very much. Uh, it's not like a bank robbery where you have an eyewitness. Uh, persons who are inside or have knowledge of it aren't going to talk for they, they fear for their life. It's probably the finest run pension fund in the United States. And that's One of the defendants in the plastics company case was Alan Dorfman, the pension fund's consultant at the time. Dorfman, the son of a Chicago Rackets figure, earlier served eight months in prison on a Teamster kickback scheme. What do you say to those who say the Teamsters Pension Fund is simply a, a large lending source for organized crime in this country? That's the biggest falsehood ever perpetrated on the American public. For several weeks now, investigators from Washington have been traveling to Teamster Pension Fund headquarters in Chicago as part of a new federal investigation. Pension Fund trustees say they have nothing to hide. But by some accounts, Teamsters investments have done so poorly, the union would do better putting its money in a savings bank. For the men and women like Paul Decker who depend on the pension fund for their retirement, the question remains, in whose interest is the fund being run? For the 400,000 Teamster members or for a few Teamster officials and their friends? Brian Ross, NBC News, Akron, Ohio. Tomorrow's nightly news special will deal with another aspect of the Teamster power. It will show how that power is sometimes used to help criminals find out where billions of dollars worth of goods are being shipped. What they know, when they know, they hijack or they steal. And we'll document that tomorrow evening. This evening's nightly news special is part three of our investigative report on the Teamsters Union. We've shown this week how the Teamsters Union grew and how its ties with criminals also grew. We've shown how one Teamsters pension fund hands out millions of dollars in questionable loans but denies pensions to some of its union men. Tonight's special report deals with another aspect of Teamster power, how that power helps some criminals. Teamsters know where billions of dollars worth of goods are at any time. The criminals with their union ties are told. Frequently, the results are thefts and hijackings. Brian Ross is our reporter. This is a police photograph. The man in the chair was identified by police as a major figure in a New York Mafia family. And this man is Danny Capolo, president of Teamsters Local 966, which represents truck drivers in New York and New Jersey. There were frequent meetings on this street corner and in this storefront nearby, filmed by police using hidden cameras. The meetings were attended by trucking company executives, convicted truck hijackers, organized crime figures, and Teamster officials. Police in other parts of the country report similar meetings between local Teamster officials and mafia figures. A lot of crime flourishes because so many in the Teamsters Union are willing to help. 
The Union stranglehold on the nation's transportation system provides information about and access to billions of dollars worth of goods. And the Union also provides legitimate jobs as a cover for loan sharking, gambling, and narcotics activity. For example, this is McCormick Place in Chicago, the nation's largest convention center. Teamsters do much of the work here. Federal investigators found that the Teamsters gave jobs to five notorious mobsters with long criminal records. The investigation revealed that one of them used McCormick Place and his Teamsters job as a cover to negotiate a major heroin deal. The others ran loan sharking and gambling operations. Have no the man who gave them their Teamster jobs is David Kay, who decides which Teamsters show work at McCormick Place. He described the five men as old friends. And Kay continues to run things for the Teamsters at the convention center, although he is awaiting trial on 74 counts of extortion and racketeering. The head of the organized crime strike force in Chicago says the Teamsters Union often gives sanctuary to hoodlums. For example, if... The union president is closely associated with organized crime. It allows uh, him to place in the union certain uh, members uh, of organized crime who would not have a legitimate job otherwise and uh, give them what we call a W-2 form, uh, an income tax return, so to speak. In this unusual police film, made in the 1960s, drivers are seen stealing from the trucks they drove and selling the goods to undercover agents. In most cases, it is the Teamsters Union, and not the company, which decides who is hired to move goods. The union's power to select drivers makes it hard for companies to crack down on this kind of theft. Organized crime investigators say some drivers are forced to participate in thefts and hijackings after getting into debt with mob loan sharks and bookies, whose activities are made possible by Teamster officials. Not all this thievery can be blamed on Teamsters, but it is easier to hijack a truck when the driver cooperates. Ralph Salerno, retired police detective, nationally recognized organized crime expert. When the shipping company needs three men, they call the union. If they send him three men who have prior criminal conviction records for exactly the same kind of theft that you're referring to, he's got to take those three men. On the eastern seaboard, the 14 states of the eastern seaboard, the FBI and other police, uh, suggest that maybe as much as 50% of truck hijackings are not hijackings in the traditional sense. I mean, a, uh, an auto with masked men doesn't pull the truck driver over and stick a gun in his face and take the truck. They suggest that 50% of them are turnovers or giveaways. It also helps to have insiders at airports, where billions of dollars in air cargo is handled each year. Federal investigators say New York's Kennedy Airport has long since been taken over by organized crime. And they say the thefts of valuable cargo at JFK, running into the millions, would not be so easy without insiders who can spot the right shipments. No one handles air freight at Kennedy without the approval of Teamsters Local 295, long dominated by Harry Davidoff. Davidoff has a criminal record, which includes convictions for burglary and extortion, and he is closely associated with major organized crime figures. Yet Davidoff gets what he wants at Kennedy, through his power to call Teamster strikes and slowdowns. At Miami International Airport, a similar story. Police here say air freight companies fear problems from the Teamsters if they crack down on thefts. In a confidential memo, investigators in Miami concluded that shippers prefer to absorb huge losses and pass the increased costs on to consumers. In all, an estimated three to six billion dollars worth of goods were stolen last year as they moved through the country's transportation system. And in the end, all of us paid for that. The victims rarely complain. Businesses absorb the losses and pass on the costs rather than risk labor trouble. So in addition to all other taxes, consumers in this country pay a mob tax, a tax collected by those often protected by the power of the Teamsters Union. In our next report, a look at how that power is used by the president of the union, Frank Fitzsimmons. Brian Ross, NBC News, New York. One further thought on tonight's special, nobody would argue that an ex-convict should automatically be denied a job. But what we've found is a recognizable pattern of using Teamster jobs to further criminal activity.
Good night for NBC News. In the course of our investigation of the Teamsters Union, NBC News learned that law enforcement authorities in 1973 observed a meeting at a California restaurant, a meeting attended by organized crime figures and by Frank Fitzsimmons, the president of the Teamsters Union. We also obtained a copy of a police memorandum indicating that police officials considered Fitzsimmons and his son, also a Teamster official, to be immune from prosecution. This is part of tonight's nightly news special, part four of our investigative report on the Teamsters. Tonight's installment deals with what happened in California in 1973 when an investigation of Fitzsimmons was started and then stopped. Brian Ross reports. Teamster Union President Frank Fitzsimmons is a frequent visitor to Southern California. Fitzsimmons' office is in Washington. But it is in California, along the fairways of golf courses and in nearby hotels and restaurants, that he conducts a lot of union business. A California police intelligence unit says it is here that Fitzsimmons has had important meetings with major organized crime figures. Lou the Taylor Rasanova, identified at the McClellan Senate Labor Rackets Committee hearings in 1963 as a member of a Chicago organized crime family. In February 1973, Rosanova came to California to meet with Fitzsimmons. California authorities knew that the meeting was to take place. Police took these photographs of Rosanova at the Los Angeles airport, and they followed him to a restaurant in Palm Springs where they watched him meet with Fitzsimmons. The international president of, uh, of Teamsters was uh, in attendance at a meeting in Southern California under surveillance by... Um, uh, investigators who work organized crime and seen in con seen meeting with uh, organized crime figures. We found out afterwards uh, that the, that the meeting pertained to setting up prepaid health plans, uh, medical plans, dental plans, uh, legal plans, things of that uh, of that nature, which would be made available to union members. But a piece of the action is going to the organized crime figures. And this was being discussed at a meeting between Frank Fitzsimmons of the Teamsters Union and people who you have identified as major organized crime figures. That is, yes. The answer is yes. What does it say to you? California authorities shared their information about the fitzsimmons Rosanova meetings with the FBI in Los Angeles. The FBI had its own investigation of a different but similar mob scheme to control a Teamster health plan. The FBI had identified an office in this building as a mafia front and had obtained a court order to tap telephones here. For more than a month, agents listened to phone conversations and developed what they considered to be substantial information linking the Teamsters to possible criminal violations. But then, under orders from the Justice Department in Washington, the FBI abruptly ended its investigation. Was there any legal reason that the investigation uh, should have been stopped or curtailed? At that time, with what we knew uh, factually and what we had uncovered from investigation and the state of the law, I know of none. No reason they should have stopped? I know of none. You should undoubtedly ask them, but uh, I don't know of any. The Justice Department said the wiretap was not productive, but agents who worked on the case argued it was. They said it led them to these men, Raymond DeRosa and Peter Milano, Mafia hoodlums who claimed they could make a deal with Frank Fitzsimmons. The deal was that doctors and dentists would get thousands of patients through the union's health plan. In return for the Teamster business, worth millions of dollars in fees each year, the doctors and dentists would kick back a percentage of the money to mobsters and Teamster officials. NBC News has obtained evidence of this arrangement. Copies of checks made out to People's Industrial Consultants, the Mafia front under FBI investigation. The checks from California doctors and dentists amount to a $46,000 down payment on the deal. One of the things that deeply troubled California authorities was that in the same week that Fitzsimmons was meeting with Rosanova, he was also meeting with President Nixon in San Clemente. Under Fitzsimmons, the Teamsters became President Nixon's major source of labor support. Shortly after this San Clemente visit, the federal investigation ended. What role Nixon or the White House had, if any, in ending the investigation is not known. But what is known is that the government never asked Fitzsimmons about Rosanova or Milano and DeRosa.
and Fitzsimmons has refused to answer our questions about the California investigation. A 1973 confidential police intelligence memorandum obtained by NBC News shows that word was being passed among high-level police officials in several states that Fitzsimmons was considered to be immune from prosecution. The memo reads, according to federal sources, any information pertaining to investigation of either the misuse of Teamster funds or illegal activities of Teamster officials is frowned on by Washington. And the same intelligence memorandum makes reference to Fitzsimmons' son, Richard Fitzsimmons. We quote, The younger Fitzsimmons is president of a Teamsters local in Detroit. It appears as though he has made several purchases of items, including a mink coat, on credit cards registered to the local. The Department of Labor prepared a case on Fitzsimmons for fraudulent use of Teamster funds and presented this case before a U.S. attorney. Subsequently, this case was forwarded to Washington for prosecution. And according to the Department of Labor representative, prosecution was declined due to the current love affair between Fitzsimmons and the White House. No further action on this case is pending. End quote. All of this was three years ago. There is a new president now, and new men run the Justice Department. But we know of no effort to follow up on the leads that were developed here. And beyond the California case, there is a continuing reluctance to challenge Teamster Power. More on that in our next report. Brian Ross, NBC News, Los Angeles. A couple of notes on tonight's special. We asked the Department of Justice for comment on the story you have just seen. A high-ranking official said he couldn't comment on what he called an ongoing investigation, which made us wonder if the Justice Department may in fact be investigating Fitzsimmons. But two other sources at the Justice Department, in a position to know, said there is no investigation of Fitzsimmons' alleged connections with me members of organized crime. Several times we asked Fitzsimmons to comment, and the answer has been no, but if he wants to change his mind and comment in the future, our offer still stands. Good evening. The Senate Subcommittee on Investigations has voted to begin a preliminary investigation into the relationship between organized crime and the Teamsters Union, a subject dealt with in detail this week on the nightly news. Senate sources say this could be the first step toward a wide-ranging investigation similar to the one conducted by the McClellan Senate Labor Rackets Committee in the 1950s. Senator Sam Nunn of Georgia is acting chairman of the subcommittee. There would be a considerable amount of manpower required on a full-scale investigation. The subcommittee will allocate whatever manpower is necessary at each step of the way. But the McClellan Committee in the late 1950s that went into this area had several hundred people involved. Senator Nunn said our nightly news special reports on the Teamsters this week stimulated both public opinion and congressional interest. Committee investigators have already begun to look into the substance of our special last night, which described a meeting between Teamster President Frank Fitzsimmons and members of organized crime. That meeting was reportedly held to discuss several kickback schemes. And tonight we have the final special report in our series on the Teamsters, this one on the reluctance of many people to challenge Teamster power. Our report Brian Ross. Well, on October the 15th, 19... Travis Dumas was a Teamster local president in Miami when he says a trucking company executive tried to buy him off during contract negotiations. The company uh, handed me a $5,000 bribe. Dumas went to the police. Detectives staked out this motel and watched and recorded the actual payoff. The evidence was turned over to the federal government, the Department of Labor. For 15 months, the government took no action on the Duma case. Then NBC News began to ask questions about the stalled investigation. Just this week, an official of the Shulman Air Freight Company was indicted in the case by a federal grand jury in Miami. When the company official goes to trial, Duma will be ready to testify, as he has been since October 15, 1974. In Chicago, another example of the government's reluctance to move on Teamster investigations. Gas station owner Rex Jones was prepared to testify that a Teamster organizer threatened him with violence if he didn't sign a contract. Well, he threatened me by saying, you're going to join the union. And he patted a stub nose revolver on his belt. And uh, duress meaning that you're going to join or else, see. Jones and 81 other station operators told their stories to local and federal prosecutors, but no action was taken. The dealers finally took their case to the National Labor Relations Board. 
In unusually strong language, the board accused the Teamsters of sheer racketeering. The board found a consistent and well-defined and organized pattern of unlawful conduct by Teamsters Local 705, so flagrant, egregious, widespread, and long-continued, as to arouse wonderment whether paralleled in board annals and why the multiple arms of the law have been so long withheld. The case of the gas station dealers and the Teamsters was referred to the Justice Department for prosecution. The Justice Department decided the case was not prosecutable. Ralph Salerno, retired police detective, nationally recognized organized crime expert. I think the uh, Teamsters are generally regarded, Dave, uh, today in law enforcement as sort of a sacred cow that's too big to fight because they've got too much money, too much political clout. I don't think you'll find many more cases arising uh, where anybody's too interested in going after the Teamsters. Uh, law enforcement men are no different than anybody else. Uh, they like to work, they like to work hard, but they like to work in an area uh, where there is a possibility of success. Few in government, or the Teamsters Union itself, appear to be in a hurry to clean up the union. At this truck stop, Teamster members said they know some of their leaders are corrupt, but they vote for them anyhow. I think this is something all of us have to live with. We don't, nobody, no one likes it, but we do. I guess we're stuck with it one way or the other. Well, I tell you what, you do. So far, they've always treated me okay. I mean, I can't complain. I can't say they've ever robbed me. If we can get the corruption out of our union, we'd have one of the best unions in the country. In comparison to other unions, I'd say it's the best. Not all Teamsters are happy with their union. The organizers of this rally in Washington accuse the leadership of selling them out in the nationwide contract negotiation. But the turnout for the rally was small. Teamster union reformers have trouble attracting support. Arthur Fox is the leader of a Teamster reform group. Teamster rank and filers, the members of the Teamsters Union, are basically fearful to start out with. They're fearful that what happened to Jimmy Hoffa might happen to them. But perhaps more importantly, or more universally, they're fearful that they would lose their jobs. Uh, this is something that the Teamster hierarchy can arrange, and does arrange on a fairly consistent basis. For the men at the top of the Teamsters Union, life is good. They've taken their places among the rich and the powerful in Palm Springs, Las Vegas, and Miami. At least 17 top Teamster leaders are paid salaries of more than $100,000 a year each. Back home, each of these men is the broker of Teamster power. Frank Fitzsimmons has said he doesn't have criminals in his union. But in our long investigation, law enforcement officers throughout the country said they have no doubt the union is corrupt and gives sanctuary to extortionists and hoodlums. I'm saying that I do not recall... Little has changed since the McClellan Senate Labor Rackets Committee investigated the Teamsters 20 years ago. James Hoffa is gone. But many of the men who refuse to answer this committee's questions about their alleged organized crime connections remain in important positions in the union. In the 20 years since the McClellan Committee hearings, there has been no major investigation of Teamster Union activities. The Teamsters have acquired more and more power and a measure of respectability. As we've shown in our series of reports, rather than challenge Teamster power, businessmen pay off, go along, and pass the costs on to consumers. Within the union, the membership has been unable or unwilling to clean house. And law enforcement officials say they cannot get the backing they need to effectively investigate and prosecute the Teamsters. The Teamsters Union is pushing a lot of people around in this country, and no one is pushing back. Brian Ross, NBC News, Washington.